Guizhang Wang is a software engineer and a computer science PhD who I work with here at Confluent. He's recently written a paper on consistency and completeness in stream processing in Apache Kafka and submitted it to an academic journal. Now, this in interestingly, this isn't just a thing he did in his spare time. It's a thing that is actually a part of his work here. And you might wonder, why would a product company, a cloud company, do a thing like that? Well, I ask him that question and I get him to talk us through his paper on today's episode of Streaming Audio, a podcast about Kafka, Confluent, and the cloud. Hello and welcome to another episode of Streaming Audio. I am your host, Tim Berglund, and I'm joined in the studio today by Guazhong Wang. Guazhong is a software engineer at Confluent and a returning guest. You've been on the show before, right, Guazhong? Yeah, I've been on the show for a couple of times. This is the first time yeah. I've been that on a video, though. Uh, I've been on, I have a, on a couple of audios, so. That's right, so again. audio only listeners, by the way, audio only listeners, you are <laughs> Uh, the absolutely the majority of the listening audience, but you can check us out on YouTube. You can see what Guajong looks like. You can see what I look like. You, there's a teddy bear in the background uh, of of my my what do you call this? My frame. Yeah. So um, you know all these things are visible to you if you watch us on YouTube. But really, no pressure. You know, I most of my podcasts I, I do as audio. So, <laughs> I see. Anyway. James, your frame is much better than mine. So, well, you know, it's it's a professional obligation in my, in my case. <laughs> Um, anyway, you have recently published an academic paper, mm -hmm. uh, a paper entitled, reading now, Consistency and Completeness, Rethinking Distributed Stream Processing in Apache Kafka. And those are, consistency and completeness are some rather big words, I mean, like important yep. words. And I want to talk about that paper. Um, yeah. But first, I want to start with a bigger question or a higher level question. Uh, why does an engineering team at a product company, you know, at a vendor, uh, why invest in academia? I mean, you are, this is computer science. And so people with PhDs don't go by doctor. Uh, you are Dr. Wang. Uh, but why does the company do this? Why do you get to spend your time doing this? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, as we are like building, you know, like softwares in the stream processing, you know, uh, fields, uh, I think both the company, the department in engineering and myself all feels that uh, it is actually good to, you know, share our lessons and share our thoughts with the whole community. And, uh, you know, because we also view ourselves as like the thought leader in this area. So, you know, as a thought leader, I think it's also like an obligation to really see, to really tell the, tell the folks, hey, this is what we think um, is important to address. And uh, this is like, how we think is at least like one way to address those you know challenging problems in the literature. So and uh, actually, I think publishing yeah. to academic conferences is like definitely a, a one good way to do so. That really, when you put it that way, it just sounds like an extension of my team's work in developer relations. <laughs> like we're we're trying to explain things on the on the one mm -hmm. hand, right? Like, hey, mm -hmm. here's how to use K mm -hmm. SQL DB. Here's how to use streams. Here's what Kafka right. is. Right. And also, you know, we're think, trying to get ideas out there, like yeah. here's how to build systems. And you're right. doing the same thing, just a slightly different audience. Yeah. I think there's maybe uh, one, I will say slight difference is that, you know, the, the communication and the message exchange is more mutual because, you know, there's have been a lot of, you know, papers and work has been published in this area. We actually have learned a lot from all other peers' work. And we're basically just pushing the, you know, the territory like one small step ahead, you know, um, mm -hmm within this whole community. That's, that's basically what, uh, how you see all the references on the paper say, hey, we are actually stepping on you know, some giant shoulders to really you know, making one small step on, on top of that. And the p other people you know, reading our paper will actually have this mutual you know, like, like idea exchange and also uh, like pushing forward the, the, you know, the development in this area, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, to some degree, everything is a remix, but that that, um, what's the word, that dynamic, that uh, kind of culture of citations and building on work and mutual conversation and support, um, it sounds like just the academic way of, of doing that. Like that's how, True. that's how academia functions. And so you, you, you know, function as an academic in this space and say, here are some ideas, let's talk about them and, and try and move the state of the art forward right. there, which I think is key because 
well, I mean, academic computer science produces things that uh, can sometimes have a huge impact on on what we call industry. True. So, um, totally. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad you're doing it. Yeah, especially in data management areas. I think it's right. the the like the connection mm -hmm. is even more strong. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us about the paper. Um, yeah, uh, that's, sure. folks, that's what this episode is going to be. We're going to talk <laughs> about this paper and we're going to learn things. So, yeah, uh, yeah. give us the abstract. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, we published paper, uh, into, uh, ACM SIG mode, uh, 2021, this year's conference. That Link is in the show notes. Sure. Uh, we will have, uh, I mean, uh, it is a virtual conference, uh, this year, uh, because, you know, because of the COVID and pandemic. Uh, but it is like the, I would say it's the number one uh, academic conference in the area of data management. So we are really glad that, uh, you know, our paper gets accepted by the committee and uh, we can share actually our, you know, really our thoughts and our lessons learned while we actually going through this, like the past three, four years of developing in this area. And the, actually the main focus is basically trying to discuss about some key, you know, design principles or challenges around delivering, you know, correct results for stream processing, you know, because in, in the past stream processing is really been considered as like a auxiliary uh, system to normal batch oriented systems where you trade off, you know, accuracy for low latency, which means that, you know, your results can be sometimes lossy or approximate, but it can actually indeed give you real time, uh, you know, uh, real time data, uh, data results. And in modern times, actually, Absolutely. Many 10 years the... ago, go ahead. Sure. I was going to say 10, 10 years ago when it was, uh, uh, current to talk about the Lambda architecture, the right. stream processing arm of the Lambda, ar Lambda architecture was described that way. Like this is cool. approximate, lossy, inaccurate. You need the batch system for the real thing, but the stream thing is like, is like, you know, it's got an asterisk on it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I think things has really changed a lot in the past decade, actually. Uh, modern systems, including, you know, Kafka Streams and KCLDB from Confluent, but also other, many other peer systems actually have been thrived to really try to say, you know, we should really consider stream processing as a source of truth in your data-driven applications, in your, you know, in your real-time pipelines. And to do that, you know, it should really provide you this, you know, strong guarantees on delivering correct results, even, uh, in the face of failures, right? So that's actually the key point of this of this paper, and many many methods that actually have been proposed to try to tackle those problems. Uh, in our paper, we are basically trying to say, okay, this is a another alternative way that we think is also worthwhile to discuss about to basically tackle the correctness guarantees in stream processing. So, walk us through it. <laughs> sure. What's the what's, um, what's the problem and what's the solution? Yeah, I, think, I mean the problem uh, is correctness in the face of failures, but right. More I can I can elaborate that a little bit more, of course. So uh, in our paper, we discussed major uh, two major properties within this um, you know umbrella of uh, correctness uh, guarantees. One is called you know consistency. Another is completeness. For consistency, we actually are referring to exactly when you know there's a failure. You know, stream processing frameworks uh, should be basically be able to not only recover automatically from the failure, but also mask the failure as of there's no failures happening at all. And by masking it, it means that, you know, we should really give you consistent results such that there's no data is duplicated and there's no data that is lost during the failure, right? So if you're looking to, you know, like uh, many systems that is proposed like maybe five or 10 years ago, they basically give you this at least once semantic, so to speak, where it means that if there is indeed a failure happening upon recovery, you know, sometimes manually, sometimes automatically, you may actually get duplicated results because you do not have, you know, resume the whole application from the consistent snapshot of, um, um, of your application. Uh, whereas, you know, right now we are actually striving to basically provide this exactly one semantics for consistency, which means that even if you have any failures, all the records in your data streams is processed once and exactly once. So that is one aspect of this correctness guarantees. Another big aspect of the correctness guarantees is basically called uh, completeness. And for completeness, what we basically we are referring to is that, you know, in data streams, 
the data is continuous and it's basically can you know income forever right there's, there's no really boundaries on your so-called you know input data set and because of that there's a key concept of called you know ordering or you know time skewness in your data streams uh, you know in the ideal world we believe that all the records that is basically sent in to your source data streams is ordered means that record that is generated later is also you know inserted into your data streams later right but in reality it is not always the case because you can have delays on your sources where you collect those data streams you can have you know you know artificial reorderings in your operators as well so when those out of order data occurs where some data which actually generates first gets arrived later how you can actually still be written about the completeness of your input and generate uh, you know correct results is a key factor in stream processing and uh, that is another aspect basically we are discussing in our paper about how to really tackle uh, this challenge so can you uh and I, I kind of want to ask some questions about just how academia functions in this way, because I'm not an sure. academic and I, I never have been. And sure. um, so, you know, you, you published this paper in, um, you said it was, it was ACM? Uh, in ACM Sigma, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, it, so you published this paper with the ACM and it's, it's printed. And is there typically, are you, are you expecting dialogue? Are you expecting merely references? Uh, like, mm -hmm. okay, now it's here and people are going to, to build on it. So what's the, I mean, you're trying to, you're trying to advance the state of the art and, right. and, and share knowledge into the academic right. community that we've developed right. as a company, but, um, mm -hmm. what happens at this point? Uh, well, at this point, basically we definitely want to see more like adoptions of our ideas that we discuss in the paper. Right. Uh, if you look into the literature, there's many. Uh, you know, big, big systems and great systems that is actually oriented from uh, academic papers. Academic papers usually say, provide you this, uh, you know, proof of concept uh, design, which gets groomed into a big system. Whereas, like, like nowadays, it's, it's more mutual, it means that the industry, like in Confluent uh, companies, actually have already have this, you know, pretty mature system called Kisiko DB and Kafka Streams, which is basically the key role that we discussed in our paper is like the runtime of of KSQL DB. And uh, it has been actually have been out there and is running in production for many years. And we basically want to, you know, really summarize what we have achieved and what was our lesson learned throughout this journey to uh, back to the academia so that the academia can actually also have mutual, you know, idea exchanges with the industry. So I think, you know, there's maybe two patterns, gotcha. right? The one pattern is that you groom some proof of concept idea from academia and the getting it more matured into, a, uh, into industry. Whereas the other pattern that we are observing and we are doing now is that you have a system that you have been developing and pushing in production for you know, some years and you actually are basically like feeding back to academia, sharing your thoughts and your, uh, your ideas. But it's not like somebody responds and says, no, you're wrong. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not oh, like it's if it could was, be. It could be, you know, in the you liberal know, arts. It could be, uh, okay. It could be, I mean, I think it's actually a good thing, right? Because like I said, you know, there's really no golden standard way to say, oh, there's only one way to tackle certain problems. And uh, all, the other, all the other methods are just wrong, right? I, I think the real, uh, the real world is just like, you know, there are many ways to do tackle uh, the same problems. And uh, for different like scenarios, for different use cases, some approaches may actually be preferred than others. And uh, it's really like, up to people to really be, be able to aware all of those you know, different ideas and different approaches. And when you are designing your system or when you are picking which you know, out of the art system you want to use, you can basically have the full knowledge on, on all of those. So I think some, you know, even some debate on, okay, which system is you know, superior on certain use cases, certain scenarios, I think that is totally uh, you know, expected and it's not. Got it. Got it. Like I, I interviewed Matthias Sachs a few months ago. Mm -hmm. We should put a link to this in the show notes um, on watermarks and like why mm -hmm. we don't use those in Kafka streams. Right. Um, and so that that sort of watermark or no watermark debate would be that kind of informed decision. And you could draw on the academic literature or 
you know, 10 years ago, 12, 15 years ago, vector clocks or last right wins uh, or, you know, for managing consistency in a distributed database. Yeah. And it course, is still uh, a, like a, a golden standard ways to basically track, you know, progress, actually. I mean, yeah, like I said, it's not saying that, oh, we, say, we think that vector clock is not the right way. I, to me personally, I still feel that in many cases, you know, using a vector clock is actually, a, you know, still a very good way to tracking progress. Um, I just feel that, you know, there are any other, other ways we should consider. So. Yeah, yeah. And that, that uh, I, I shouldn't have brought that up because that's an interesting one because from a formal perspective, that such mm-hmm. such as what, and, and you're not a full-time academic, you're a, you're a, a PhD yeah. who works in industry, you write code for a living. Right. But if you are a, a full-time scholar of computer science, uh, that's the kind of situation where you could, you know, easily convince yourself this is formally mm-hmm. a stronger solution. Mm-hmm. And then you go to, you know, sort of developers trying to build applications mm-hmm. based on systems that use ve- vector clocks and managing their own uh, consistency, um, their conflicts between rights and, and all, you know, you, you end up with code that's buggy, uh, you know, so the industrial experience and the, the formal evaluation can also be different, you know. True. Uh, which uh, I suppose that's kind of a vacuous thing to say. Sometimes industry and academia don't agree. Uh, yes, Tim, you're right. Thank you for that insight. Uh, my guest today has been Guo Zhuang Wang. You know, right? <laughs> that's we all know that. But sure. Yeah. Um, so it's not so much debate. I mean, there's debate. Yes, there's debate. But it's more mm-hmm. like here's a contribution. Here's the thing to think about. Now let you know you can build on it. Yep. It it sounds like so listening to you describing the problem. It sounds like. Um, the exactly once semantics of of four years ago are just the backbone of the solution. Can you walk us through that a little bit? So you laid out what the problem is. What is sure. the solution that you propose? Yeah, yeah. yeah so totally. I, I think uh, basically because Kafka streams, aka Kisiko DB, is built around Kafka, and Kafka is like considered as a you know Red Hat log replicated across different machines, right? So our approach for tackling exactly once is also be heavily leveraging on the fact that we have a you know immutable, ordered, and persistent log that we can leverage. So the key idea here is that uh, whenever we are actually trying to uh, do any of the uh, operations that is uh, atomic, meaning that let's say when you are processing a record, you want to maybe do operations such as you want to commit its position on the source. You want to generate some outputs into your uh, you know, downstream streams, or maybe you want to update some of those states, right? And uh, exactly what it requires that all of those operations need to be done automatically, meaning, meaning that even if there's a failure happening, uh, you basically can guarantee that those operations either succeed uh, altogether or none of them succeeds. You don't want to have partial effects. Partial means that, for example, if you have already sent your output to downstream, but you fail to commit, to your input stream. Then upon recovery, you will basically process your input record again, which will generate duplicate uh, results. So by actually leveraging the log, we basically can actually achieve auto- automatically by tr- basically reducing all of those operations when you are processing you know, one or more records into log pens. And by leveraging a you know, two-phase transactional, uh, uh, transactional protocol, we can make sure that all of those log pens that is, re- that is basically representing as, you know, committing your input, you know, sending and acting on your output, and also updating on your states can be done in a transactional way. And hence, they are all atomic. So that is basically the key idea uh, that uh, we are proposing here. Uh, if you compare that with, you know, many uh, different literature approaches, which is leveraging on, you know, checkpointing, or like, for example, watermarks that is basically delivering through the, as the global consistent uh, snapshots, I think uh, one, you know, I would say benefits from using this log-based approach is that you can actually consider having shorter, uh, shorter end-to-end latencies because you do not really need to couple the problems of, you know, handling consistency from, for example, handling completeness. And hence, you need to actually need to block on waiting a bit longer to basically achieve those, uh, those properties. Okay. Um... Now, uh, I've 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 lost the question. I was going okay. No, the, the two phase commit uh, thing right. you described. So you right. 
again, that sounded like EOS that you were describing, which is right. Kafka's answer, and this is how we do it. And it's it's you know inside the Kafka world, uh, a four year old thing, but so many people still don't understand it. It's just a lot of people don't use it, and it's mysterious. Mm-hmm. And I just want to kind of separate out at a high level, since we don't have sure. a huge amount of time, and we're not sharing a whiteboard. Um, <laughs> And the paper is linked in the show notes and you can read it. You don't even have to pay. So just go read it. But um, the using the log is intuitively mm-hmm. satisfactory, right? Like we've got this right. great distributed log and, you know, that we know that logs of immutable events are mm-hmm. a good way to agree on progress and converge on an account of exactly. state in a system and all that is like, okay. Um, two-phase commit sounds like a bad word. And mm-hmm. again, this is not a new <laughs> thing in, in Kafka, but um, right. it strikes me that that might be some of the criticism that comes our way mm-hmm. with this approach. So why, you know, in the 2000s, when people were doing that kind of thing in enterprise systems and you had the, you know, Java transaction controllers and, and things like that, it was, it, was, it was death, you know, nobody liked that. Um, why is this different? Uh, I think actually the main difference is that we, although I call it a two-phase commit, Maybe I, I need to consider using a different term, but the, the two-phase commit is not really on the stored data on the states themselves. The two-phase commit is on the logs, uh, indeed. And the reason that we use logs for two-phase commit is that, like I said, logs are ordered. That's why, you know, when you basically use, uh, you know, two-phase commit, we are not really say, okay, we have to wait on, for example, uh, make sh- making sure that all of our operations before are finished because. Once you do appends, right, all the appends are naturally ordered by the time they get into the log, right? And uh, the, so more mm-hmm. details that are in the paper for sure, but by basically using those so-called transactional uh, markers that we actually use as a log appends, it's basically semantics is basically meaning that, okay, all the log appends that is before me on the log can be considered either as committed or aborted. And by leveraging on this natural ordering, right, between, you know, um, different records in the log. The two-phase commit we leverage on Kafka only requires, you know, write once on the log. Whereas if you look into the standard literature for, you know, for two-phase commit uh, protocols, you basically need to write twice, one on the stores, on the states itself, and another times on the log. Uh, I think that is like a a big difference that we are actually, uh, you know, advocating in our paper. Got it. And it's still, I don't, I don't think it's the wrong term to, well, okay. It's a term with a bad name and a bad history. So if there's something else we could come up with that would avoid the, the raised eyebrows that, that we get. But, um, it seems faithful to me because you still have a transaction controller that is, you know, you've got these parts that are doing things and they succeed with the thing they succeed at is appending to a log. And then there's this other, well, like I'm the leader of this thing and I'm going to make sure those appends happened and they have. So, I mean, it, it's still there. But right. it's I guess there, it's yeah. the, um, the, the each individual contributor to the transaction is still just log appending. Right. And, and just, so, just like I said, I, I, don't, I, I won't say that our proposed ideas is totally a new. We are basically standing on, you know, the shoulders of many gens. Uh, we are just pushing one step further, we think, that can actually, you know, in the, in the new, you know, streaming world by leveraging on the log even heavier, we can actually make some more nudges uh, around different trade-offs. Absolutely. And that's, that's always the case, uh, in industrial settings or academic settings, you are, uh, you are not doing this all by yourself. Somebody taught you things, somebody helped you, somebody gave you something to start with. Uh, you know, I didn't write my own text editor. Um, I didn't write Z shell. Uh, (laughs) IntelliJ is something I bought from somebody, you know, Mm -hmm. all these things are true and we, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, we build on each other's efforts. Um, what's next? You got anything in mind that you're able to talk about that might be your next academic contribution? Um, well, we actually do have a couple of very interesting projects that are working on. Maybe in the future, we want to actually feed back into the academia as well. One project is we are working on is uh, the so-called K-Raft uh, protocol. Uh, K-Raft uh, stands for Kafka Raft. I think we Kafka have this Raft. pattern of naming everything with a K at the moment. Uh, but basically, what we are doing that is uh, p- as part of like this the zookeeper removal project, where we want to actually let Kafka itself to manage the metadata again as a log uh, uh, instead of using zookeeper. 
Because if, when you look at really what really we are using Rookeeper for, we are using Rookeeper to manage the whole metadata of Kafka, like uh, things like, OK, which brokers act as a leader for those topic partitions, right? Uh, what are the ISRs uh, for those partitions? What are the credentials or maybe ACL configs for those uh, for those topics and for those clusters? Those are all metadata we stored in Zookeeper, and uh, we actually try to basically build this metadata as a special logs. I call it the, the the log for all logs because all the Kafka data is also in logs, right? But this special logs using for metadata is going to be used to maintain the maintain all the meta information within Kafka, which we use to basically store them in Zookeeper. And that actually helps us to basically provide this quorum controller instead of a single controller today. That is a single, like I would say, scalability bottleneck within Kafka. I think, uh, you know, of course, the, the rough algorithm is not invented by us, uh, but we actually are making uh, making it to be a little bit different with the original paper of Raft to make it really to work, you know, smoothly within Kafka. I think that is something we want to also maybe feedback into the academia, just like I said at the beginning. I think. You know, the main purpose of, you know, for us, for conference, to write papers in academic conference is to say that, you know, we have actually absorbed and learned so much from the literature, from the community. I think, you know, we, it's, it's really in our, in our uh, obligations to really share our thoughts, to feedback into, uh, into the community as well. So true. And uh, yeah, KRAFT is kind of the emerging name for that, capital K, capital R, right. little right. AFT. And um, I know it as... KIP 500, which is imprecise, you know, but the sort of the KIP 500 thing or the, the right. quorum controller or like, you know, these these names that it goes by. KRAFT, or you see it in print, Kraft always makes me think of like a garishly orange macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I see. And I don't know why. <laughs> that association is there somehow. But, um, and that's, again, that's that's merged into main of, of, of Kafka and it's released for mm -hmm. non-production use and as of Kafka 2.8. So like this is a thing that's out in the world and you want to get it into the minds of mm -hmm. academia so they can think about what's going on here. Sure. Well, my guest today has been Guajong Wang. Guajong, thanks so much for being a part of Streaming Audio. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And there you have it. Hey, you know what you get for listening to the end? Some free Confluent Cloud. Use the promo code 60PDCAST, that's 60PDCAST, to get an additional $60 of free Confluent Cloud usage. Be sure to activate it by December 31st, 2021, and use it within 90 days after activation. Any unused promo value after the expiration date is forfeit. And there are a limited number of codes available, so don't miss out. Anyway, as always, I hope this podcast was useful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, you can always reach out to me on Twitter at TL Berglund. That's T-L-B-E-R-G-L-U-N-D. Or you can leave a comment on a YouTube video or reach out on Community Slack or on the Community Forum. There are sign-up links for those things in the show notes if you'd like to sign up. And while you're at it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. And if you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover it, especially if it's a five-star review. And we think that's a good thing. So thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.